Welcome to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. I know we have a few guests here who have never been here before, and we're so glad to have you here tonight. I am Beth Hessel, the Executive Director of the Athenaeum. We are a member-supported library, special collections library, and community forum, a gathering space where we nurture curiosity and strengthen community as we talk about the things that we love. Books, art, music, literature, history, architecture, and the built environment, our city, and the way that all of these things combine together to help us better understand who we are and where we are today so that we can be stronger as individuals and as a community. We're so glad to have you here tonight. And we invite you, if you're not a member, to ask me or Mike back there or test downstairs or go online and find out a little bit more about what it means to be a member of the Athenaeum because we're an always growing community and we'd love to have you as a part of our community. So thank you for being here tonight. As I said, we have a special program tonight with three thoughtful and eloquent authors talking about one excellent book. A novelist, feminist, frequent contributor to New York Times opinion page, Mom, that's how tonight's moderator, Jennifer Weiner, describes herself on her web page. I, I loved that. And I, I told her a story how this is a different story for you all. I won't tell it. But she and I, in an alternate universe, could have been former sisters-in-law with each other. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds great. So that, that was something I learned today from my mother-in-law, and I, I thought that was quite fun to, to find out. <laughs> um, but she's a New York Times bestseller. I think most of us have read at least one of her, her many novels. She's a Philadelphia favorite. I, I saw on Free Philadelphia, the, uh, the free, free Library of uh, uh, YouTube, that um, she's, she's spoken there more than any other author. Um, oh. So, <laughs> more. <laughs> <laughs> so she will bring her humor and her insights to what should be a compelling conversation with Christine Pride and Joe Piazza. Uh, these two women have written a riveting, emotionally compelling, and thought-provoking story of two best friends whose lives are altered and whose friendship is tested by an act of violence that traces the wounds that racism have created in this city and in our country. Christine Pride is a writer, an editor, and longtime publishing veteran. She's held editorial posts at many different trade imprints, including Doubleday, Broadway, Crown, Hyperion, and Simon and & Schuster. And we needed our member, Lee Rogers, who um, finished his career at Simon oh, & Schuster yeah. here. He lives next door. I should have gotten him over. Um, he's a, she's a freelance editorial consultant who does select editing and proposal content development, as well as teaching, coaching, and penning a regular program, Race Matters for Cup of Joe. And she lives in New York City. And I don't know how, in the midst of all that, you managed to write a novel. I don't know either. So, um, <laughs> I don't remember any of it. It's a blur. It's a blur. I'm, I'm breathless with all that you are, you are, you are doing. <laughs> yeah. And, and Joe's co uh, Christine's co-author is Joe Piazza, who is an award-winning journalist, editor, and podcast host, another woman who just wears so many hats. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, CNN, Marie Claire, Glamour, and other notable publications. She's the author of Charlotte Walsh Likes to Win, How to Be Married, The Knockoff, Fitness Junkie, and If Nuns Ruled the World. In those books, just for the titles alone, <laughs> you have to pick up. It's all in the title. She, she lives in Philadelphia uh, with her husband and two small children. And so it's a thrill to have you three ladies here. And I invite everybody to join me in warming, warmly welcoming tonight's speakers to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. Thank you. Oh, you guys good. can hear us, right? You can hear us, yeah. Thank We're you. loud women. Loud <laughs> women. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, thank you, too, for writing this book, which was um, riveting and, and funny and embracing and bracing <laughs> and hard to read in places and necessary and hopeful. And I want to ask, I think the first first question is, how did this all come about? <laughs> Where did you get the idea? Yeah, when, yeah. 
walk me through. How did Christine propose to me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was Christine's idea. She's had this nugget of an idea, as I feel like a lot of editors do, mm -hmm. um, for a book for a long time. And then Christine was my editor on Charlotte Walsh Likes to Win, my last novel at Simon and & Schuster. And then we did this really quick and dirty book for the TV show Younger. Mm. Um, so it was literally quick and literally, literally dirty. dirty. Yeah. They yeah. required it to be actually yes. dirty. <laughs> um, we wrote it in four weeks to get, I mean, essentially, Christine was the editor, but we wrote it together in a Google Doc. And afterwards, we had Stockholm Syndrome. We're like, we should just keep working together forever. And this was in January 2018. Mm -hmm. And so like Joe said, I had this idea and I just went to her and it did feel kind of like a proposal. Mm -hmm. and said, I, went, yeah. I have this idea, would you want to write it together? And, and I said, I will accept your rose. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I mean, honestly, the idea is just so interesting. I've been a journalist for 20 years, right? And so I've seen how the media covers police shootings and violence against black men. And it's terrible. It's so superficial. They never get at the humanity behind anyone. Um, that's involved in these tragedies and I was like this is a real chance for us to tackle this with fiction And I kind of like I got the tingles. I got like this little feeling. I'm like we have to do this even though I was very tired. Yeah After writing Charlotte Walsh likes to win and tackling women in politics I just wanted to write about puppies and Rose <laughs> yeah. And also we were I mean I was still working full-time Joe always has a million side projects and we started this It was like a side hustle. We were doing it at night on the weekends just thinking maybe this will turn into something and here we are. <laughs> and I'm just wondering, locate me where we were in time in mm -hmm. terms mm -hmm. of what was going on in Philadelphia with our own city's, mm -hmm. you know, shootings and riots mm -hmm. and responses to to that. I mean, had that happened or were you kind of you know. I mean, it was it was consistently having. I mean, Philadelphia was having consistent issues mm -hmm. with the police mm -hmm. um, and with the black population. And nationally, we had just come off of Ferguson. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, it's about a year yeah. past Ferguson. It was one of those times yeah. where I feel like there's you know these things happen in it feels like rash and lull and rash and lull. And we, like I said, started thinking about the idea and. Um, late January 2018 um, and we started writing like we were in a Google Doc uh, in that March right around the time Stefan Clark was murdered and that really sticks out in my head as kind of a galvanizing moment in time in terms of we were really in the project and really feeling the weight and why we were doing this and it was one of those headlines that you feel like comes and goes comes and goes and it's so easy to get desensitized and have it you know all these so, names become a blur and, and this is before everybody is posting black squares on the Ex Instagram. well before so well before. before so well before and, and yes before every single person buys how to be an anti-racist yes. 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 well before, yes. well before. I, I, we can, we can circle back to this, but yeah. one of the things that I'm so fascinated by is everybody went out and bought the same five books, <laughs> nonfiction yep. books, mm -hmm. about how to eliminate the scourge of racism from your own heart and life and family. And no one seems to want to read the novels, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Which is, is a, it is, it is bewildering to me yeah. because how better to understand the human experience and the people Right. And and yet, you know, you mm -hmm. can give them, you know, white fragility all day long, mm -hmm. but it just seems like fiction is, is like a bridge too far. But we can we can talk We have lots of ideas yeah. about that. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> some mm -hmm. yes. I've noticed mm -hmm. and I yeah. Okay. Oops. So um, when you decide to write a book with two people, like I can barely do it with one person. <laughs> and, I, and I hate myself by the end of it. So how how? Yeah, That's a good yeah. Question. We, I mean, we almost didn't. We almost didn't make it. Honestly, we um, we almost got divorced. We did. We we're contractually a few times. Yeah. A few times. <laughs> we were contractually obligated to stay together, so legally so, it would have been I difficult. Mean, let me let me ask you a procedural yeah. question. Yeah. Did mm -hmm. you sell the book on a pitch or we partial? Sold it on a partial. Partial. Okay, so let, yeah. me, let me just for those of you yeah. who are not publishing professionals. Yeah. Um, what that means, mostly with fiction, you have to have the entire book written before you go out with your agent to, to publishers and to editors and hope that they will buy it. Why did you decide, so selling it on a partial basically means you've written 100, 100, 100 pages. 100, yeah. And then you go and you generally have an outline and you, you can say like, you know, here are my characters, here's what's gonna happen next. Um, tell me why you decided to do it like that. 
Yeah. I mean, mainly we were busy. <laughs> we, were like, we, we need proof and, of concept. Yeah. We need to know that this is going somewhere if we're going to take exactly. the next year. And also for Christine, if she's going to quit her job, honestly. Yeah. Um, and, and how much time that was going to take and, you know, what a time frame would be. We couldn't just work on this indefinitely mm-hmm. as a side project, right? Yes. We had to know that based on 100 pages. And also, even though it's rare for a book to sell in a partial, Joe and I were a little bit known quantity since I've been in the industry and Joe has written a million books, you know, so there were some mm-hmm. beliefs like if we could come up with a good 100 <laughs> pages, we could probably come up with a good 200 more. <laughs> we, could take, we could probably take it home. Yeah. 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 Which was a you know, blind yeah. faith. But, you know, from the, from the very beginning, we had to figure out how to work together. Yeah. And so that at first required Google Docs. What do you write in? This is so embarrassing, and I'm so old. Don't like, say longhand. Microsoft Word. Thank not, you. Not longhand. <laughs> <laughs> I picture a yellow legal pad. <laughs> Jesus. No, but I write, I write in Microsoft Word, and then when my daughters got old enough to be in school and started to use Google Docs, they yeah. send me their work, and I'm like, I don't know how to do this. Oh, thank you. And I this still is... don't know how to do this. And the mm-hmm. youngs, they all use Google Docs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like, if you have like a younger editor, or person in, in publishing, they will send you like track changes in Google Docs. And I'm like, please God, no. 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 Please, no. please so just no. That was Christine. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, you, guilty. Uh, and I had I had been I mean I was still working in like magazines and on websites at that point. So like I was living inside Google Docs, and I was like, this is the only way we I can't. We are going to trade back exactly 1,500 different Word documents. Um, March 2nd, version March 2. 2. <laughs> exactly. 11 a.m. No, 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 it's like final, 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 yes. final, 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 they just build, right? They just build. Like, I was like, very like, reticent, though, so Joe had to bring me kicking and streaming, kicking and screaming to go It was our first fight. Yeah, it, it was really was, bad. Yeah. But then we had to talk about race. <laughs> <laughs> that paved the way. That was the icebreaker. So I'm, I'm going to just make an assumption, which is that everybody thought, I, I'm assuming everybody thinks you were Jen and mm-hmm. you were yeah. Riley, but it, it wasn't like that at all, mm-hmm. no? No. So have we all, has everyone read the book? Most of you. Okay, so, you know, Jen is the white friend, the white character who sort of looks like a trailer park Gwyneth Paltrow, yeah. mm-hmm. how she's mm-hmm. described. Mm-hmm. And Riley, from formerly Leroya, is the black friend who is now on a very, very thinly veiled KYW. <laughs> very, 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 so very, very veiled. Yeah. Yeah. Nidia Han read the book several times <laughs> prior to publishing. <laughs> and, and she's gunning for Renee Chenault's old job, yes. although she was, she was on Channel 10. But, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, so she's this young, um, very talented, very ambitious, degree from Northwestern um, black journalist who is wanting that anchor job. So bad. And, so bad. And recognizes in this shooting of an unarmed black man both a tragedy and an opportunity. Mm-hmm. So right away we have complications for Riley and then for Jen, her husband is the, her husband Kevin is the police officer who shoots this kid. So off to the races we go. Yes. Um, and, and so both of you are Riley and both of you are Jen. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Yeah, that well, was I, I do want, I want to bring up, we did an interview with a man um, a couple of days ago who had clearly never read a novel. Mm-hmm. And he was like, and so you're Riley you, Jen. you're Jen, yeah. you're Riley. <laughs> We're like, that's not how fiction works. not how fiction works. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. He just could not wrap his head around the idea that we weren't these people. Uh-huh. I, but I think a lot of people do make the assumption. Every interview we've had. Yeah. Every interview we've had, yeah. But it was really important, as Beth said, that we wanted to have a book that felt really cohesive. Um, and if we had done it that way, it would have just felt so disjointed. Because as you know from writing a million books, like you have to create a voice that is um, like not yours, like an authorial voice, right? And so that's really what we wanted to do. And also we wanted to be involved in both characters and bring them to life. Um, and and I needed to, to us. I needed to filly all of the oh, characters yeah. too, oh, to make so sure that they all felt like they were from yes. Philly. Yeah, and you had to give them the Mary East Town mm-hmm. where it's like they're mm-hmm. going to Wawa for their hoagie. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Right. Lots of Philly sweatshirts. <laughs> a lot of Eagle sweatshirts. There is a baby named Chase. Um, <laughs> But I mean, really, we can honestly say each of us touched every word in this book. Um, but we did start out, because I was so used to just writing, 
and Christine was so used to editing, like the blank page is freaking terrifying. So I would like bang out the original draft and then Christine would rip it all up and then I would cry. Um, and I was like, why do you hate me so much? <laughs> all of this is typical. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally normal. And, um, but then Christine got more comfortable with it as we went on. And we each just like, it's like, all right, I feel like I can totally do this chapter. I'm going in, yeah. the, going into the dock. I'm going going in. The dock. So I, I'm sure that there were moments where you were each telling the other one, no, you've gotten this wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, talk to me, give me an example of that, where it was either about race or about <sighs> class, which is also a mm -hmm. major issue in this mm -hmm. book. Um, gender and things that women, because we're nice and we're the peacemakers mm -hmm. and we want to be liked and we smooth it all over and don't yep. go to those places. Mm -hmm. Where did where did the trouble happen? <laughs> all of the above. All, all of them. I mean, all of it. Mainly though, race. I mean, to be honest, like our characters, Joe and I were new friends when we started this book. I, our characters met when they were um, babies. Babies. Yeah. So yeah, they were like four or five. Um, and so they obviously weren't talking about race at that point. It's kind of the only time in your life that you're colorblind. Um, and so they, it was a muscle that they never developed and they never had to do it until they did have to do it, which happens in the pages of this book. Um, but the parallel is that when Joe and I met, we were new friends. And so we embarked on this book together, uh, but we hadn't, we talked about a lot of things uh, in the year that we'd known each other before this, but we hadn't talked about race. Yeah. and so. Uh, you know, we had to dive in and, and talk about a lot of things and in an accelerated way that you might, over time, making a new friend, mm -hmm. do it in baby steps. Uh, we didn't but have we didn't have the luxury of that. We were all in. There's one, I mean, there's one example that really stands out from the very beginning, um, which when we first got Riley on the page, and Riley's our black character, she was very perfect. Like everything about her was perfect. Her, and her family was super perfect too, mm -hmm. until you like, you know, dug in. A little bit more and I can't stand a perfect character like I just want everyone to be real messed up um, because I like I like my women to be complicated the way that we are in real life mm -hmm. and so I, I kept suggesting things that I you know had put on white characters in other books you know does is she is she anxious like does she drink a little bit too much um, was her dad cheating on her mom and her family's dealing with this like did she have a teenage pregnancy and Christine like put her foot down and I didn't see why she was putting her foot down, but she's like, these are all tropes and stereotypes that are always put on the black women and black families. And I don't want to do that in this book. Like, we have an opportunity to not do that. And for me... An I'm, obligation, really. An obligation, you know? it's I mean, true, yeah. Representation-wise. Um, and for me, I was like, this isn't about race. This is about creating a good character. Like, this is about a good, interesting book, and no one's going to like this character. And so we really had to go back and try. I mean, so the line, this isn't about race, this, like, not everything is about race, is in the book yeah. from our conversation. And I had to, like, completely shift my worldview because I'm just so tunnel, like, narrative, narrative, narrative. And I could not see why it mattered so much to Christine. And that was frustrating. We didn't speak for, like, a week or two weeks. Um, but that incident, like, once we finally, like, came back together and we're like, all right, let's talk this out. Like, why were you like this? And why were you like this? Um, that helped us start to finally have more real conversations and a lot of those ended up on the page but there's so much silence in the book mm -hmm. it's right. like you know you're just the like characters. talk to each other yeah. yeah but and they can't and they yeah. can't and, and i almost wonder if we as a culture haven't been in, through sort of our own fast forwarding because i think i'm maybe a little older than you two but like when i was young it was like well, we don't, good people don't see color. Yeah. We treat everyone the same. <laughs> totally. We treat everyone well. And, you know, that was just how nice people did it, right. right? And then you get a little older and you start to think, well, if I'm not seeing color, how am I making sense of it in my own head? That yeah. There sure seem to be an awful lot more poor and struggling black people than, than white people. Yep. If, if color doesn't matter, then what is going on here? And then you start to learn about redlining, and then you start mm -hmm. to learn about the veterans who came home and couldn't get loans, yep. and then you start to learn about the school to prison pipeline and all of the ways that systemic racism is this kind of quiet, invisible, insidious, yeah, that has so much, that has leached its way into the water table of our world, and I, I feel like.
like these are just things we didn't talk about mm -hmm. and none of us have those muscles you know no. I, I and and I think that there are layers of, of gender on top of that uh -huh. where it's like you as women like you don't make people uncomfortable. Uh -huh. you're uh -huh. not supposed to uh -huh. so talk to me about complicating Riley in ways that didn't feel stereotypical or harmful yeah, I mean, Riley is a character who keeps everything compartmentalized as a coping mechanism. So even aside from race, which is a big one, you know, that she's dealing with in her life on a day-to-day -day basis, but issues with her family or her romantic life, I mean, that's just how she deals. Um, and so, you know, that's part of her growth or evolution as a character really is for her to kind of confront that and to realize that you know both she and Jen are not talking about the race and other things for very different reasons but both very valid reasons you know Riley doesn't want to be the person who's always talking about race and she's worried that Jen won't get it or she's worried about Jen's reaction and a lot of that is valid and Jen in a parallel you know is just not understanding the degree to which race is a factor in Riley's life and that she's experienced you know, lots of issues when it comes to her race. And partly that is because Riley hasn't told her and that's when you get the reader to, you know, want to root for them to finally, like, just address it. And, and they can't really have the authentic, close relationship that they want to have and that they think that they have and that their shared history is kind of based on without a willingness to go there. You know, this is the thing that they've never talked about, but without even maybe them realizing it has come between them. And so this is really an opportunity for them and we want the reader to see that that's the case and then in real life, you know, that that also is the case, right? That you can lean into these conversations. And I love the way you described it to me when we were having this conversation about Riley being more complicated and you're like, Riley has to be perfect because she has generations of women like almost on top of her shoulders being like, you are the first person who gets to do this. Yeah. And I'm like, great. We don't have that on the page yet. Right. <laughs> and so then, you know, from a writer's perspective, I'm like, okay, now I get it. But like, we have to tell the reader that because the, like the white reader especially didn't know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think you get that in the, in the scene where she goes to church with mm -hmm. her mother and suddenly she goes from being you know, a daughter, a sister, a complicated human being to somebody who is the representative, yes. high achieving, mm -hmm. local girl made good and came back home. And and you see it, you know, you see her sort of take on that yes. facade mm -hmm. and it's just amazing. And, uh, and it's an opportunity, but it's also a burden, right? You know, I mean, she's as driven as she is. It's it's hard to carry the expectations of you know generations on you and you know especially she has such a close relationship with her grandmother Gigi in the book um, who's a great character but and modeled after your grandmother and modeled after her. Okay. my sister's here so she can attest to that <laughs> Lindsay um, I but you know she feels this pressure and this you know that she could live a life and have these opportunities that her grandmother couldn't even imagine and that's just you know, two generations, like her grandmother's still alive and it's still unfathomable what she is able to achieve. And that's, that's a lot to carry. Talk to me about the title. Mm. We had it from the beginning, which you know is so rare. So I mean, rare. How many times do titles change oh through the, the lifespan of a book? Um, yeah, a lot. I, Usually the sale, it's not over until the sales force okay. <laughs> And even after that happens, if Barnes & Noble or Target doesn't like it, you can have to go back to the drawing. Yeah, room. like up until the moment the print, the book goes yeah. to the printer, yes. the title can change. Yes. I mean, it's, and uh, you're, whatever you are creatively in love with... Seems it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. No, it's totally. all about the marketplace. Yeah. Which is why this is so rare. And we actually had the title before we even had a word written, which is also really rare, but it just... It just came one day, um, and also rare was the fact that our cover was the slam dunk from the beginning. Yeah, and yes, so we yeah. had these We're, two. Again, if so rare. Doesn't like your cover, yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't like your cover. You're getting a new cover. Getting a new cover. <laughs> yeah. New cover. Yeah. New title. Especially, I mean, at Barnes and Noble, there's this one buyer who's not there anymore, named Cecily, who did all the fiction. And if she didn't personally like the jacket, <laughs> like herself as a person, like the jacket, it was like back to the drawing board, start over. Mm -hmm. Oh, the power she but had. But it, it was Christine's It was Christine's idea. The idea, like, the name came to her as the, the name for the second book, which is also very good. Like, you're very, it's like you've it been an editor yeah. for, like, 20 years or something. After all this time, it's is good it for something. Fair? We're still not like that. <laughs> yeah. We are even less 
less yeah. like that. Still <laughs> different. Still different. Still different. <laughs> who's the we and who's the them? Because it shifts depending shifts. on whose perspective you're in. Yeah. And, you know, you have the black family saying, all white people are going to treat us this mm -hmm. way. You have the white people saying, oh, just wait, they're going to riot. That's what those people do. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, I could, I could hear people from my own life yep. Yep. saying those things. And I'm sure lots of readers are going to feel that way. Um, and I, it, it's just so powerful because I think by the end of it, you realize that, you know, in your head, you're the we and yeah. they're the them. And in their heads, it's like, you're the them. And I, I just, exactly. you know, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, it really comes down to the tribalism that we have these days, right? Everybody thinks they're we and other people are them about so many issues and so many things. Right. And so I think that the title really resonates with people because no matter what side of anything you're on, we just keep thinking like, no, we, we're, we're not we're like that. Like, like we're yeah. different. Yeah. That's not us. That's Those absolutely. people do that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we wanted the title to resonate in that way because as you just said, you know, we want the reader to feel like their allegiances have, can change throughout the book, mm -hmm. right? Or that they're surprised by a perspective that resonates with them or they're surprised that they identify with one character over another or, you know, <laughs> and that that makes us feel like we did our job because I think a lot of people will come to this book with preconceived notions. It's a hot button issue, mm -hmm. you know, there are strong sides, there's a lot of rhetoric around this, um, and so I think people will assume that we had an agenda, you know, and that we're writing some sort of morality tale and all the things, um, and so we want readers to feel like, oh wait, oh wait, oh I kind of, oh I didn't think about it that way, oh when that character says that, like I get it in a different way. So let me circle back. Why Philadelphia? <laughs> well, it's the greatest city in America. <laughs> oh my God. I, I was waiting. Every time somebody asked her that, she gets a chance to say. It's the greatest, it's the city, greatest city in America. In America. What, uh, why else, where, where else would we put a book? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. But also, uh, but also, it was, I mean, it was really the right city for this story. Um, because Philadelphia. We did consider other places in the beginning. You did. Yeah. She, <laughs> she went through the motions of letting us brainstorm other places. Um, Philadelphia, well, first off, what we really needed to make sure of is that 30 years ago, the city would have been diverse and neighborhoods would not have been as segregated that a little um, white girl and a black girl that were from working class families could grow up right next door to each other and become best friends. And Philadelphia, while it is still ridiculously segregated, is also a very diverse city compared to a lot of um, other big cities in America. But on top of that, Philadelphia has such a complicated history with systemic racism, with redlining, with the move bombing, with the Black Panthers, with Mayor Frank Rizzo. And it's funny because we wrote the Frank Rizzo statue into the book. Mm -hmm. We had a protest mm -hmm. and it was taken down after, During, after, yeah. after the book was published. That must have yeah. been very strange. It was strange to be watching I'm it. Going to address that in, in Future editions. Yes, yes. <laughs> Reprint correction. Reprint correction. Yeah. From Columbus point of view, because I feel like that they like, built the, the walls around so uh -huh. people can't get to it. Um, and Philly is also, when I mean, going back to the title, right? We are not like them, a very tribal city. Yeah. I mean, Philadelphians as a whole, we think we are not like any of them out there <laughs> in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, but then also by neighborhood, yeah. by like yeah. racial group, like we are just a very tribalistic group, so Philly was the right place. It was. To write, and to write every other book that we did. <laughs> oh boy. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not getting the middle of There's a lot going on in this book. Okay? Like there's, um, obviously there's this police shooting which animates it, but then you've got the question of Jen, who has been struggling with infertility, who's finally, finally, finally managed to carry a pregnancy um, thanks to Riley's assistance and, and loan. Mm -hmm. So there's that overlay of the financial transaction between these two women. Um, there's a character, an elderly character who's in the hospital, who's sick, who's maybe dying in the course of the book. There are romances mm -hmm. rekindling in the book. Mm -hmm. there's, there's the question of what is gonna happen to Jen and Kevin's marriage. Um, both of the protagonists have these extended families with different um, issues going on, including, 
I, I'm just going to say it, one of one of the most memorably hateful mother-in-laws <laughs> that I, I think oh, I've cookie. ever Oh, Cookie. Cookie. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, She's she spectacular. Loves, she loves her boys, mm-hmm. but oh boy. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering about making all of that yeah. work. And did you have to make choices? Like, were there things that got left? Like... Did, did Jen discover she had a half brother at some mm. that's during a draft? Or... Yeah. <laughs> Riley, in the beginning, fun fact. Mm-hmm. In the beginning of this book, Riley had four other brothers. <laughs> there were so many of them we couldn't keep track. Yeah. So And in the first draft, Jen had three other children. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, what are we doing? What are we doing? This is so, so those fun. brothers are now in like creative heaven. Like I don't know where characters go, but <laughs> I, I have two brothers IRL, and in every one of my books, my protagonist only has one, and so my brothers are always like, so which one of them? <laughs> <laughs> did you kill this guy? <laughs> like, I don't know. Read it and find out. <laughs> find out, exactly. But um, I, I was... Um, I was I was interested in that. Okay, yeah, so, let's, so we had a lot of stakes. I mean, to answer, like, we really wanted to, to lean into giving everybody in the book a lot to deal with right. um, which gave us a lot, a lot to, to deal, deal with, with. Yeah. I mean, when you describe the book i'm like wow yeah a lot happened in this that. book yeah um, and riley's parents are losing their home yeah. there's this thing happening with riley's this, the one brother who survived yeah. has a yeah. story the one brother that survived one the surviving brother, brother. Living brother. Yeah. you know it, it's yeah. just so interesting i'm wondering if you guys read um Andrea Elliott's piece yeah. about Dasani. Mm, yes. Mm-hmm. So yes. For those of you, Ugh. yeah, okay, so five years ago, five or six, maybe Tw- No, this seven, is 2013. 2013. Yeah, Christine tried to on. buy Andrea's book. Oh, yeah, I'm obsessed yeah. with Andrea Elliott. So Don't get me started. New York Times reporter was writing about homelessness in New York City, and she was hanging around one of the most, like, notoriously awful homeless shelters, and she figured out that her way into this story was the children, yep. right? Like nobody is is going to sympathize much. Or people are going to bring their own biases to the table when you're talking about adults, but when you're talking about a little girl, that's less likely to happen. So she finds this extraordinary little girl mm-hmm. who has eight siblings. Mm-hmm. They're homeless. The parents um, are just profoundly damaged, as we come to learn from all of the obstacles that poverty and, and race will hand you. But but this girl has such promise and such Spunk. spark, and, mm-hmm. and she's a dancer, she's a writer, she's a track star, she's an athlete, and you just leave the story thinking, oh, she's the one who's gonna make it. Yeah. She's got so much in her that she has to make it out of here. And oh my God, that book like stabbed me in the heart. You finished it already? Oh my God. Oh, wait, it's 600 pages and it came out last week, so. I <laughs> started it. Yeah. You are dying to find out, like, is she going to be yeah. the one yeah. to like to make, rise, it. Yeah. To, to make it out of this? Yeah. And I don't think I'm giving anything away because I think the excerpt in the Times kind of made it clear that the answer is no. Mm-hmm. And the answer is no, even though this girl went to a boarding school, like left her family, went to the Hershey School in Hershey, Pennsylvania, which has wraparound services, which has every kind of counseling and every kind of support and teaches kids academics and teaches them etiquette and sports and sportsmanship and how to be in the world from kids you don't always know. And, and in spite of all of that, you watch this girl get pulled back by by the by the pull of her mother, yeah. basically. Mm-hmm. Like the mother who doesn't know how to be a responsible parent to this girl and doesn't understand that the greatest gift she could give her is to let her go. Is to let her go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was just thinking about that so much as I read this book mm-hmm. about how impossible it is when you're dealing with generational poverty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, Riley's the one who's made it, right? She's gone to college, uh-huh. she's gotten her degree, she's made it out, but you understand what a rule-proving exception yes. a story like hers yes. would be. I know I had a question in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, we went to an Invisible Child Book Club and I'm here for it. I'm, I'm like, so oh, here for it. We should do, we, we should talk to Andrea. Yeah. Um, well, no, but that reminded me, you know, of how Andrea looked for the story that would be relatable, right? right. She looked for the, for, for the child. And 
Christine and I were looking to bring race down to like this really microcosmic level of a friendship, of individual stories about people that you care about. Because I think it, for a lot of people, a lot of white people in particular, it gets so big yeah. and it feels like something you can't wrap your head around. And like you were saying, it's so abstract. a lot of people bought right for White Fragility and I think half of them read it. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're being generous. They think mm -hmm. I may, might, be, might be being generous. But so when things happen, like when Riley's parents can't afford to keep their house or they couldn't buy in a certain neighborhood because of redlining, you're like, oh yeah, like that. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the microaggressions that Riley gets when people call her the N-word when she's on air every single time she goes on air. Right. Or the or the colleague who says that she lives in Society Hill and it's so wonderful because all those kids from the ghetto get to come mm -hmm. for Halloween. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or the um, the colleague who passes him her coat uh, at the Yes, uh, the fundraiser at the she fundraiser. Goes to exactly. the DA. We didn't even talk about the DA. Yeah. Oh, Sabrina. Oh, Sabrina. Oh. Sometimes we forget about <laughs> By the way, I heard that I heard that Society Hill comment. <laughs> But I heard it in Fairmount. <laughs> yeah. I think FairmountNextDoor.com is yeah. where a lot of that kicks off, is what I hear. Yeah. yeah. There. Mm -hmm. um, but to your point about Andrew Elliott's book, which is, you know, by all accounts, going to be a masterpiece, I bought it in Parnassus when uh, Joe and I oh, did it. Oh, you did, yeah, I carried yeah. it around. It was very heavy. Yeah. yeah. But there are a lot of people who aren't going to pick up that book. You know, there are a lot of people who aren't going to pick up any of the nonfiction books that we talked about. And so or we, read them. Or read them. Yeah. Um, and so we wanted to use fiction as a way in, right? I mean, nothing sparks, we hope, more empathy than a novel and for it to feel relatable and that you, you know, we're sneaking the social justice in, right? Like, we just want this to be a compelling story and that you fall in love with the characters and, you know, wonder what's going to happen so you keep turning the pages. Like, all the regular, just general elements of, like, good storytelling and craft. And then if you learn something about race along the way, great, you know. But I feel we felt like you like did that with could... Big Summer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> come, come for the friendship, stay for the social commentary about the patriarchy. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. We say so yeah. social justice. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, and we're like, stay for the social justice. <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Um, you know, at separate, at different points in the book, you just want to shake each one of them. Yes. Just, just freaking talk, talk, talk to her. Do it. Yeah. Tell her. Mm -hmm. And why is it so hard? I mean, and I think we've touched on some of this already, yeah. but like, why? I think they both bring a lot of fear and apprehension. There's a lot of fear and anxiety, table. but like different, you know, so I think Christine was more surprised than I have been on this tour with how many people we have talked to that say they have a spouse of another race, they have a best friend of another race. Um, we actually, we just got a wonderful email from a woman who is the best friend of a very high profile a black woman. Famous. Famous black woman who's on the woman. cover of magazines talking about race and she's like, you opened my eyes. I've never <laughs> talked about this before. Wow. We oh did God. an interview in a bookstore with a bookstore proprietor who said, I was married to a black man and we never talked about race. A black man who has also made his career and life's work publishing black race about race. race. It, it, about race. And, it was shocking. And then the mother who had adopted two kids from Haiti and was like, we never talked about it. Yes. So for all the times, you know, when Joe and I were creating this book, we thought, is this realistic that they mm -hmm. have this between them? And, you know, this, you is, my, know. You this know. is my chance to give a shout out to some people in the audience mm -hmm. because my best friend from when I was 14 is here. My best friend from when um, I was in first grade is here. And we talk about race all the time. I mean, maybe not when we were seven and 14, um, but it has been an ongoing topic. And so I think I came to that you know, thinking about these relationships. And Joe's like, no, 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 people are not doing this. And I'm like, no, 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 they are. So it doesn't feel right to me that they're not like digging in earlier and, you know, in a more detailed way. But now it has really been illuminating that people are not talking about race. Well, and also the stakes are so high. I mean, most people mm -hmm. are not sort of entering that first conversation because one of their spouses has shot some right, no, right. No, 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 no. True, yeah. true. Yeah. That isn't yeah. a common way. Can we just talk about Kevin for a minute? Sure. Oh, yes. Was he supposed to be kind of a dick? Like, <laughs> in the first, so in the first draft, he was a total dick. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the worst. Right. He's supposed to be more of kind of like a cipher. Like, right. it's hard to get at him, um, mostly because that's 
very cop like mm -hmm. you know like cops are so reserved they're very distant. reserved they're very distant they don't want to talk about their jobs even with their wives yeah. and because we could only get at this from jen's perspective we couldn't get in kevin's head mm -hmm. we didn't have any other way to like really humanize him except for when he talks to his wife yeah right. um but we needed that distance because we talked to so many cop wives and they're like no, mm -hmm. they're like he is just like, yeah. and I don't think Jen fell in love with Kevin for his sparkling personality. No, no, um, it's very clear. Yeah, <laughs> it's like he's selling ads on Comcast when she meets him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he. And, but, He's just know. stable, right? And she that's what Jen wants more than anything. And I think part of the interesting thing to talk about in the book is, you know, why people are with who they're with, right? Mm -hmm. and I, or even when it comes to Riley and Jen's relationship, you know, I think a fair question is, what makes them friends? And will they be friends? And, you know, if they met now, would they be friends? No. Um, and so in the same way, you know, you ask, like, what does Jen see in Kevin? Mm -hmm. What is Riley I think that's in an Jen? interesting book club question. Right? Yeah. What is Riley C and Jen? And you know, I was thinking about that because you know, Jen does get a lot of like hate on the page, even though I do think a lot of people like see themselves in Jen in a way they don't like, which is why they there's a reaction, there's a reaction to it. But you have to remember, Jen is just loyal, is the thing. She shaved her eyebrow off for Riley. Like she will do anything for her friend. And she also has Riley on this pedestal which is why she never thought about race, because she's like, she's the prettiest, smartest, most successful person. What problems does she have? And yet, there's that one moment mm -hmm. where she goes to visit her at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Jen doesn't go to college. Jen is a waitress at Fat Tuesdays, poor thing. Mm -hmm. And right in my neighborhood. And I walk, I walk by there on my way home, and I will pour one off. For yeah. and, you know, so here she is. She's, she's the daughter of a single mother. Her whole childhood was hand to mouth, and now she's got this hand to mouth existence. And she goes to visit Riley at Northwestern, yeah. which is this iconic, mm -hmm. you know, when you think of college in your head, that's you're probably picturing a campus like that. Yes. And she sees everything Riley has and yeah. thinks, we have the same grades in school, we ran the same times at Penn Relay. If I were black, I could have had all this. And you just, you just go, oh, Jen, no. Mm -hmm. Oh, honey, oh, honey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, but, but she's not the first or last person to have that thought, for sure. <laughs> so. mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it, it's just this, you know, again, like familiar but yeah. cringeworthy yeah. moment. Yeah. And there's so many of those in yeah. this book. And it's, it's a hard read sometimes. I mean, mm -hmm. it goes to some, some hard places, including the ending where... So there's this sort of crusading DA who's mm -hmm. looking to make a name for herself with this shooting and what she does with the case. And, and we, you know, is there justice? Can there ever be That's when, the question. when a 14 year old boy is dead? But the book ends with another shooting. And you just know that this will continue. There will be another one and another one. And Justin's mom will put on her mother's at the movement hat. Uh -huh. And she will drive down to whatever city this has happened in. And she will stand with whoever this mother is in, in communion. And um, it's just, it, it's a its a hard, there are hard places that the book yeah. takes you. And yeah. I, I mean, I'm wondering what the editing process was like. And if at any point anybody said, you know, hey, like, could, could we have a bridal shower? Yeah! Could, shower? could the baby shower happen? Oh, yeah. Yes. Poor Jen. Her baby shower is canceled. It's canceled. She's canceled on account of costume. And she's yeah. real, and you know what? She's real pissed about it. She's yeah. pretty bitter. Um, the book has gone through a very interesting process, like a lifespan. And we had early readers, some like early white readers, who, like, you know, people who are very influential in our careers who said things like, take out the lynching. It's too much. No one wants to read about the lynching. Um, or some of the things that um, our white characters do say in white spaces, things that I have heard in all white spaces yeah. that are painful to read, they've said, oh God, oh God, we can't, we can't put something like that on the page. Or you're going to get canceled. Like, are you ready to get canceled for this book? Um, that was a big, big yeah. thing. And at that, like, Especially with the lynching, and we had another um, person who said, "I don't know if these the black Riley family is black if enough. Riley is black enough." And huh. yeah, so the behind the scenes yeah. of this the behind book, the scenes yeah. of this book has been 
And that, but that was a moment for me to really, like, I had to be like, no, and stand up. Like, I was scared. I, was, I mean, like, you know, this is my livelihood. Um, like, I don't want to be canceled, but I'm like, this is the right book. Yeah. And the, this is, you're, you're essentially telling a black woman writer that she's not writing a black character correctly, you white person. <laughs> so yeah, but that's There's a lot of irony there. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that something that black writers hear regularly? Yes, that's yes. Really, yeah. in the all-white publishing industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's right. real. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there, there, people told us to take out a lot of the things, and we just we felt really strongly yeah. about not. Well, we also, I mean, we knew we were writing about something really controversial and hard, and the only way you can do that is to really lean all the way in, right? Like, we were just going to be committed to doing it, because once you try to start diluting or thinking about the audience and who's going to react this way and who's going to react that way, you'll just twist yourself up from a pretzel and we, we wouldn't have had anything on the page, yeah. you know? So even, when, you know, we were talking about, like, some of the thoughts that Jen has, you know, part of why we wanted to write this book together is because, you know, people do think these things and, or you overhear them, and we wanted both sides to be represented and to see that conflict because there are the things that we think in our minds but don't say out loud but we see them in the book and there are the things that we say to some people and not others and we see them in the book right and there are some things that you think and say differently you know <laughs> to your audience right and so by doing it together and also with the perspective that we have shifting back and forth, we could get all those angles. And we've gone so far on the spectrum of performative anti-racism yeah. um, that I think it is interesting for people to see what is in someone's head and what they say and who they're saying it to, because it is still mm -hmm. happening every day, every. despite the black squares. My sister was telling me about a hot button thread happening in Montgomery County, Maryland <laughs> with the school system and racism. I mean, this is like... Oh, yeah ongoing it just sort of feels like it never ends at the same time that we didn't want the book to be bleak we wanted the book to be hopeful um in terms of you know as hard as it is there is a way through or there is you know some optimism to be had so as much as our characters go through we did want the resolution of this to be that you're rooting for the friendship and that you feel good about kind of where the characters end up both as their friendship, but in their relationship, but also in their own lives, right? They still have some evolution mm -hmm. and some growing to do as individuals, too. Right. Um, I'm sure lots of you have hmm. questions. I don't even know what to so, Yeah, I know. We lost track of time. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Who wants to ask something? And, and I will just, if you want to ask about the book specifically, if you want to ask about, I think, publishing. Sure. And, and anything. Writing, all the things. Anything. We are here for you. If you want to talk about Invisible Child. <laughs> Totally Everyone go buy Andrea Elliott's <laughs> wonderful book. <laughs> it is, yeah, so, so good. I could talk about how to read. Yeah. It just broke me. Well, Christine also published um, Three Girls from Bronzeville, mm -hmm. which just came out like, about a month before September 7th, ours, yeah. And Don Turner... Um, you, you tell everyone about that book because it's so good. Uh, a plug. Yeah, uh, ever the editor. Just want everyone to buy everyone to uh, oh. So this is a book called Three Girls from Bronzeville, and Dawn is a, a former Chicago Tribune columnist, and she covered race her whole career. And so the memoir follows her and her uh, younger sister and her best friend, who she met when they were both eight years old in third grade, and traces their lives from their girlhood to their adulthood and all of the twists and turns, I mean, really shocking developments, and I will not give any spoilers away, but the kind of animating question of the book is, why do our lives turn out the way they do? You know, and what are the forces between personal will and choice versus how other things like your gender, your race, you know, affect your trajectory in life. Um, it's really, it's, it's good great. if I, if I do say so myself. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Other books to read, yes, but we will take questions. <laughs> My mom. Ah, oh, Tracy, <laughs> first question. This is a selective question as an observation. Oh. Um, I just finished oh, no. the chapter where Riley has interviewed tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't read the whole book yet. But after reading that chapter, um, I wanted to go back and read for a while. Mm -hmm. um, mainly because when I first read the prologue, I thought, how are they going to write a book about mm -hmm. this young black boy gets shot in the street, um, even though he's an art, um, that happens every day. Mm -hmm. And for lack of a better word, I think a lot of us are 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. desensitized, yeah, 100%. Definitely. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I almost didn't, or I hate to say this, or I meant it, but I almost didn't look at him as a person. Mm -hmm. I just looked at him, oh, you know, he's another kid that got shot. Another headline, because right. that's how, the, I mean, that's how the news, then, especially local media, covers it. I mean, I did a whole podcast about gun violence in Philadelphia, and the Philadelphia Inquirer refused to even run obituaries of most shooting victims because um, they're like, why? Why? Why would we do that? Like, or what did they do wrong? Yes. Why? Why did this happen to them? Yeah. Um, until Helena Benius, who is a national treasure, um, convinced them to start running obituaries from a nonprofit called the Obituary Project, which is like every single person's life deserves to be celebrated. Absolutely. Um, but it is a huge problem in media that we do not cover these stories, except everyone likes a shooting headline, because everyone wants to be like, oh my god, did that happen? Was that in my neighborhood? Right, right. But no one cares who the, like, not, they don't care enough who the people were, so I think we're very, yeah. very, yeah. very yeah. desensitized. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, that's what we wanted to do. I mean, the book is really about a friendship, and we knew we wanted to write about a friendship from the beginning, and yet we thought it was really important to open the book with Justin for all the reasons you described, right? So that you can see that this is not just like kind of a device for the story, but mm -hmm. that this was a real, you know, human, complex, multidimensional person that you can wrap your head around and feel like that's somebody that you know. And, um, you know, that is a different way in, and I think, to your point, invokes more or a different level of empathy than when you're reading the Philadelphia Inquirer. Mm -hmm. That is the local paper, right? Yes. <laughs> Just okay. And it's an, it is actually, and it is an excellent, excellent paper. I mean, it really, it's just the fact that, like, no one, no one reads the news anymore, yeah. and that's, that is not what gets clicks on the internet. Yeah. So. <laughs> Please don't. I am just amazing. Yeah. And I would hope as a friend I would be more empathetic, even though I'm so career minded, mm -hmm. I would be more empathetic. Well, we'll see if your allegiances uh, shift as we'll you go see along. What happens. It's like you just discovered. Yesterday, mom. <laughs> it's like you just discovered I wrote a book yesterday. <laughs> Joe, Joe texted me one of your first comments about the book like last week, something nice that you said. And so I was like, oh my God, Joe, that's so nice. Your mom is just reading the book. <laughs> she read about it in People Magazine. It was like, this sounds like a good book. <laughs> She's already written so many. Did you buy that book? Joe's mom wrote no, she gave it. I gave it to her. <laughs> She's gonna buy one She's tonight. She's gonna buy one tonight. <laughs> Fran, because it's an autograph copy. Fran Weimer used to take my books out of the library. That's amazing. <laughs> that did not give me that sale. I'm surprised my dad, who they know is the cheapest person alive, I'm surprised he has done that. Every book you have. You have. Yeah. Yeah. You just got really into the Outlander series and didn't have a lot of time recently. Yeah. There's a new one coming out. Next <laughs> Don't distract her. She hasn't gotten to the end yet. <laughs> All right, anyone but my mom. Yeah. <laughs> question. What made you guys want to co-write a book you had a title and then it seems like you started talking about right there. Like, what made you want to no, so we had worked together. I was Joe's editor at Simon & Schuster, so we had worked together and had this great professional relationship and had developed a friendship. And so when I came to her with this idea that I thought we were just kind of talking about and Joe was all in, um, but it seemed like a good opportunity, one, to keep working together, which is... dip my toe into the water. Yeah, you really don't. Right She's in. like all in no matter what. But it seemed like a good opportunity to continue to work together, but also because of the nature of the idea it seemed like we had a unique opportunity to partner together as a black woman and a white woman to bring our different perspectives to the table. I mean, I could have written this book alone. Joe could have written this book alone. Probably shouldn't have. But it wouldn't have been as good a book. I mean, we really don't think. It would be a very different book both ways, but we really feel like we had a way 
and we hadn't seen it done before. And as an editor, you're always looking for something that you know feels like a new and fresh way of storytelling. And so, and it's proven true because, you know, writing the book, I think, was in. We came up with a better book for the journey together, but also I think our off-the-page experience and the way that we are so open and honest about our, you know, thought conversations about race and and how we push through is also part of the publishing story of this book. Um, and so that's been really interesting to talk to people on a personal basis in that way. Yeah. Yes. Lauren. Um, so, turn on the news today and it's one state after another trying to ban reporters. Oh, God. How do you guys feel as authors writing about this topic in a time when there's so much coordinated backlash yep. and silencing around the topic that we really haven't talked for scratch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's nuts. So, I mean, so, many, so many thoughts. And again, I think it's like boiled down to, first off, like the fact that Facebook now dominates everyone's news, that's, that's how people are getting information. But also, when now people hear the word critical race theory and they're immediately in a tribe, right? They have no yeah. idea what it means, but they're very angry about it. Yeah. And that's one of the things we were hoping to do with this book, to like bring it down to such a personal level that you have to think, like, oh, critical race theory just means you're gonna talk about why Riley's parents couldn't buy a house in this yeah. neighborhood? Like, that's, I mean, people, you can relate to that, but you hear critical race theory and it sounds so sterile and all of a sudden you know that this person likes it and this person doesn't like it and then you adopt it as part of your identity. Mm -hmm. um, and it's become this huge thing, which I think is also why it's so hard to talk about race now because it's become this big thing. We did an interview with Deborah Roberts, um, which is airing on Friday morning uh, for Good Morning America and she was just like, it's become the third rail in America. You can talk about everything. I knew everything about like Christine, except we hadn't talked about race. And when I've been, do, I've been doing some talks um, without Christine when I've been doing them down here. Yeah. I know. <laughs> down here in Philadelphia, to a mostly white audience, to be honest. And when, also when people ask questions, they're very nervous. Like they almost don't want to ask the question. They're like, I'm going to say it wrong. I'm going to da, 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 da. And it's happened on interviews yeah, too. Yeah, definitely. Where we've been like, just say it. Yeah, it's, okay. it's fine. Like maybe you'll like, and I said that too. I'm like, my giant anxiety, I feel like I st sound like a stumbling sitcom dad sometimes when I'm talking through this. But I'm like, I'm just nervous. I was going to fuck it up. I'm like, I don't want my friend to think that I like, I'm saying something insulting. I don't want to sound stupid. Like I like to sound like I know what I'm talking about. Um, and that's why I was scared to talk about race, but Christine also took that as like an apathy. She's like, she doesn't want to talk about race because she doesn't want to talk about race. And so we both had to talk about our anxieties. And yeah. we're just, I didn't even answer your question, but I think that when you get to like this micro level, then you can start to actually talk about it instead of the headlines and the news don't do any of us any favors. And then politicians taking it up as a mantle to yeah. like rally their supporters is insane to me. And I also think like for CRT, it's such a clear backlash to last summer, right? So I think there's this idea of this great racial awakening we were having and we were all going to like pay attention to the systemic and look at this and that and the invisible forces and everybody's going to read and learn. And now it, CRT is almost directly the pendulum swing of, no, we're not going to do any of that. We're not going to teach our kids any of that. We're not going to learn about history. We're not going to do anything. We're just going to be like going forward and no one's going to look in the past, you know? And don't that, you tell me I have to feel bad. And don't, don't yeah, did. did. I was even ancient mm -hmm. history and that's the other reason why we incorporated some of the um, historical elements in the book that we did because I think there is this idea that racism is ancient history and like we elected Obama it's over uh, and so by showing just in one generation or two generations right like this is not something that's like people don't have a personal connection to actual racial trauma you know let alone what's what's happening now um, but you know we hope our book I mean, palatable is not the right word, but that... It's tough. It's not, not the easiest of reads. No, but I, I, I just mean that the people who might... Our ideal reader is actually somebody who might say, oh my God, I'm so anti-CRT. Oh my God, this book looks like I saw, I saw it at Target. It looks so good. I saw it, it's really, I saw I'm, it on my Instagram. Yeah, I saw it on my Instagram. <laughs> a bookstagram or really yeah. took a pretty picture of that with a latte. So I'm going to read it, right? And have another right in. Uh, and that's that's what we're hoping that we can get a wider audience um, because of the way we've approached the subject. I think the Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, 
Oh, thank you. I can tell you have a lot of Philly loyalty, too. Yeah. <laughs> Lauren is running for city council and she did my Charlotte. Oh, yes! Charlotte. I didn't recognize you yes, behind yes, your yes, mask. Yes, We've yes, actually yes, met yes, before. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, yeah, and so, I mean, right now we're just, we, we do want people to pick up the book who would not normal, who will not pick up white fragility, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, there, or how to be an anti racist because they feel attacked. Yeah. Um, and, but, like, we're hoping that like you do not feel attacked picking this up because we are approaching it from the lens of a friendship. And that people can talk about it. We know that there are gonna be very different conversations in all white book clubs versus all black book clubs. And it was a fine needle for us to thread to write for two different audiences. I mean, like everything else, I've been an editor for 20 years, you know, publishing is, segregated in terms of like the types of books like the, you have an audience in mind for a book like this book is for a black audience this book is for a white audience same with tv know. shows which we're discovering now as we're talking oh my about god people. they're like we, we, we would make a show for never it. talk to development people in hollywood and they're like we've done little fires everywhere so they're like huh uh anyway but <laughs> But we, we want book clubs to have those conversations separately, but we're also really trying to foster this idea that book clubs and individuals can have those conversations together um, and that different audiences who are actually definitely going to take different things from this book um, can come together and have those conversations. So we're not so siloed having the same conversation. So, And the people are into it. That's, oh, that's good. Can we have that? Yeah, I learned that we were doing this program at like, <laughs> that's good, that's good. I'm really into it. Um, I learned that we were doing this program at like 11 p.m. on Instagram. Like I'm swiping through and I see Joe's Instagram page and she's like, Christine and I are announcing a new project where we're doing, and I was like, ah, oh, we are. Uh, but it's working, I, it's working and it's really fun to see people. Yes. And they both got the book. Yeah, it's really, it's really good because I mean I think it's always yes. To Deborah Roberts has two friends, um, who a white woman and a black woman who have been friends for twenty six years, and they both want to read the book, and then um, so they have it now and um, are going to talk about it. But I also think it's almost easier sometimes to talk with somebody you don't know about this book even, right? Because they don't have any pre preconceived notions about you or your experience or history, and you might be able to be even a little more honest. Totally. Um, but like Len and Lou. Like Len and Lou. Yeah, we had two of them at Heineken, and I was in for like a corporate diversity event, and uh, they had two men read it. Not our target <laughs> They both cried. Yeah, an older, yeah. Older, white, southern gentleman. No, that was Lynn. No, that was Lynn. Lynn was an older, white, southern gentleman, and Lou was a black guy in his 40s from Denver. Totally different perspective. They had this, like, the most like, beautiful conversation about this book. Like, they both had their lives with each other. It was amazing. Like, they both had their lives with each other. They both had their lives with each other. They both had their lives with each other. By using parts of the book. Uh, men. Yeah. And it made it, it was such an interesting corporate event, too, because, I mean, their whole thing, and I think corporations pay a lot of lip service to this, like, bring your authentic self to work, and we want to embrace everybody, and blah, 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 yeah, and, like, let's examine our unconscious bias. Um, but this event actually did foster what that ideal was, where you wouldn't necessarily go and talk to your coworker about something personal, like Lou, like Lou shared, you know, that his sister is a black journalist and gets all the kind of comments and how upset she gets, like every time she runs a story, no matter you know how she feels about this quality of the story itself, the comments are just like all like race, 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 and how upsetting that is. He might not have just gone to the water cooler, you know, to talk with any of his coworkers about that, like, hey, guess what? But that was an opening, and then that helped Lynn understand his experience a little more, and, you know, he Lynn shared. Was like 10 years out from segregation. Yeah. Yeah, don't, do not do it. <laughs> yeah, it's really. The real world impact of people reading this and actually doing things, you know, like talking to people and changing their actions is really just 
I mean, it's only been two weeks, but it's very gratifying. <laughs> Rewarding. So with that, you guys are going to sign. Of course. You must. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, this whole event was actually really about Andrea Elliott. <laughs> Let's FaceTime. <laughs> Carly, did you bring copies? <laughs> We're so glad that the three of you came for this wonderful conversation. Carly from Headhouse Books has books back there. I know some of you brought your own copies already. Um, Joe and Christine will be back there to sign, and, 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 and Jennifer will also be back to sign her, copies of her books. We invite you to buy copies for yourself. For someone you want to have this conversation yes. with, I mean, I admit, as I was reading the book, too, I was thinking about some of my current friends and friends I grew up with who I never have had this conversation with. and, and what it would be like to break the ice. So, so I appreciate that. Um, please join me all. And also, you know, we normally have receptions after we have our programs. And because of this gosh darn virus, we cannot do that. But I think one of the things we have learned during this pandemic is it really is not that glass of wine and the deviled egg that we're holding on our plate that bring us together. It is, as you were talking about, what is in our hearts and what we share with one another that builds community. So I invite you to stay and talk with one another. Don't feel like you have to rush out. Buy some books, get them signed, and please join me in thanking them for the wonderful conversation tonight. <laughs>